Let me introduce you to my little friend who's not, who's not so little. He's a <laughs> large and capacious filmmaker. I'm Ron Suskind. Uh, we are going to have a discussion with Oliver Stone. We have a companion audience at the Harvard Film Archive that will um, soon, at 7 o'clock, give or take, be watching Snowden, which will be in movie theaters around America on Friday. I have seen the movie. I found it extremely enlivening. And I've lived these issues of intelligence for many years. I have written many books, and I teach here at Harvard. I teach narrative in various ways at the law school and otherwise. And this will be an exciting conversation. Oliver and I will talk for a bit, so. and then we will open it up to questions to the audience and, um, and get into it. Those are harsh spotlights. So anything you could do to just deflect them a little bit? I feel like I'm an interrogation here. <laughs> Please. This is a Guantanamo moment for you, Oliver. I was here in yeah, exactly. I was in ninety. I was here in ninety-two, January, uh, for JFK. With it was quite an interrogation that night. But uh, happy <laughs> to be back. I'm here actually for the Harvard Film Archive with my friend Hayden Guest. He invited me here because they they wait waiting for me to die <laughs> and, and contribute my papers and stuff. Those papers I have. But, and Ron, I've known since I read The One Percent Doctrine, which I, knocked me out. So, and I think it's really, uh, The One Percent Doctrine applies to this movie as well. Yeah. The One Percent Doctrine, for those of you who don't recall, um, was a book I wrote in 2006. And the doctrine is also called the Cheney Doctrine. Uh, simply put, uh, Cheney at a briefing a few months after 9-11, uh, was given that hair on fire report that uh, Pakistani nuclear scientists had met with bin Laden and Zawahiri, uh, the number two, I used to call him bin Laden's Cheney, and, uh, and told them things that were harrowing. They were trying to get their hands, bin Laden and Zawahiri, on, on weapons, on plutonium and enriched uranium. At the end of the briefing, uh, Cheney says, we need to treat these low probability, high impact events in a new way. If there's a 1% chance that terrorists could get their hands on these weapons of mass destruction, we must treat it as a certainty. It's not about our analysis, it's about our response. This doctrine has been a guiding doctrine uh, right to this day. And in some ways, Ed Snowden is uh, arguably the most significant character on the stage now as to the consequences of this doctrine and all that it yielded. Um, what's interesting, Oliver, is that um, I've known you for many years and, and you sometimes like to do a little method acting. Um, you know, you get into the characters you're, yeah. you're uh, creating on screen. In this one, uh, you kind of felt at times, I imagine, like an intelligence official. You're going to see people in Moscow, including meeting Ed Snowden, under various carefully crafted provisions. Tell everyone some of the backstory yeah. of how you made this movie and ended up in Moscow. Uh, well, briefly, uh, I didn't want to make this movie. I didn't, somebody had approached me about that. I, I knew Glenn Greenwald. And uh, I much respected what Snowden did when it came out. And, uh, you know, but thank you very much. I'm not chasing the news. You can't do that with a movie. It takes too long to make. It's too hard. Things change. Things come out of the woodwork. There could be a new, new charges, this, that. The character dies or reveals himself in another way. It's very, very tricky. So I passed. Uh, he sold his book to Hollywood. And I, a few months later, was called by actually Snowden's lawyer and said, please come and meet him. Uh, Anatoly. Anatoly and buy and consider buying my, the book he wrote, a fiction book about a spy in, in, in a 1984 situation in Russia. Uh, so it was an interesting idea. I went there out of curiosity. And I think Ed was very wary of me, and I was wary of mm -hmm. the situation. Mm -hmm. So it, it took about two more visits, actually, until June mm -hmm. of eight, 2014 
to commit to this thing, yeah. but to decide, we decided to do it realistically yeah. after buying Anatoly's book, which right. was interesting, as well as what the book. What kind of a book was it? Was it any it's good? A, it's, yes, it's a spy uh, thriller. Based on a Snowden-like character, yes? Yes, who goes to Russia, and of course the Americans uh, are trying to get him back and so forth and so on, but in it there's discussions in a Dostoevsky kind of way, confessionals, long, windy <laughs> paragraphs about the meaning of, of uh, the, 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 the Orwell state, and I thought that was pretty interesting stuff. So, uh, so we ended up, up buying the, the Guardian book became the, the first basis, but then there was corrections to be made in the Guardian book. Right. Ed started to fill us in over a period. Of, I ultimately made nine visits several with my co-writer, Kieran Fitzgerald. Uh, we learned a lot, but we also went back to the records, conflicted public record, as you know. Uh, there's uh, Glenn Greenwald's versions, and of course we talked to... Uh, Everyone knows who Glenn Greenwald Glenn is? Everybody you and, uh, you, yeah, I imagine so. You and McCaskill, uh, he was another reporter there. Uh, and there was, of course, Laura's, Laura's film, which was available to see, as well as whatever we could find on him. And, talked to whoever knew him, including uh, Sarah Harrison and uh, ultimately uh, to Lindsay Mills. So the a challenge you face right off the bat is a lot had been done at that point, and you had to do something that was distinctive. Um, even with Snowden becoming a character that had inhabited, at that point, the imaginations of people everywhere. Listen, it's, more, it's even worse than that. I mean, it was, <laughs> by the time we did all the research, which was, you know, reading, you love that stuff, I don't. The, the, te <laughs> the technological details of this stuff is mindlessly boring. I mean, the, the names of the programs themselves are as mindless as a Pentagon programs can be called. It, Keystroke, the, prism. 100 plus, and that was at the, sur at the surface. At that point, there was only five or six. Yeah. Prism, Keystroke, uh, Boundless Informant. Mm -hmm. uh, my God. And they're then, unimaginative people, these intelligence But then that eventually, me. well, we find out, it's true, but we find out there's hundreds of programs and that Mr. Snowden's stuff was at the tip of the iceberg. A lot of that is still unreleased information. Right. Uh, fascinating. But uh, how to make it into a movie? I wanted to make Enemy of the State or something like that, which of course was a completely unrealistic but fascinating uh, mm -hmm. vision of the NSA. Mm -hmm. And then there was the Bourne identity, that's CIA. But very, very little had been written about the uh, NSA. Uh, the first, uh, uh, you know who, uh, James Bamford, I deeply respect. He wrote the first book in 1982, and he wrote two more. And he's been, uh, he's been the, one of the most strictest uh, critics of the NSA. Uh, and did, Jim, uh, did you have Jim help you in any way? As much as possible, but I didn't, we didn't hire him. We, he stayed on the other side of the fence as an yep. independent. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Binney worked as a consultant. Sure. Bill was the first guy, a phone man, a phone whistleblower. Expert. Well, he's more than that. He was a phone genius. He yeah. actually figured out uh, thread, uh, silver thread, thin yeah. thread. I think it was called thin thread. The first program. He's the Nick Cage character, kind of in the movie. Mm -hmm. For three million dollars, he figures out a program to tap the world, but do it elegantly with the separation of targeted targets versus the wide mass bulk. <laughs> surveillance that we have now. Uh, Oliver, tell me what it was like when you, uh, when you first meet Snowden. Now, everyone has, at that point, an impression of Snowden. You see him on that grainy screen. Uh, you know, pretty articulate fella. To the surprise of many people, uh, what did you expect walking in and what did you find yeah. in Moscow? Well, I just want to fit in one little detail because it's important for the yep, thread sure. of this thing is that from Bill Binney, the grandfather generation, I call it, we moved to Tom Drake. Now, Tom Drake is crucial to the story because he's in the movie, you'll see it. Tom Drake was the other, a high, uh, high uh, level uh, NSA official who actually took the NSA on and got really scraped to the edge of his, yep. his skin. I mean, he ruined his life, but he won in the end and he was, his charges were acquitted. So if you find out anything about Tom Drake, gives you the basis of the, he's the next generation. Then Ed Snowden comes along. This is five years into Obama, 2013, which is shocking because Obama was the man who was going to re reform the, trans the secret government, right, we right. thought. Which is a point that is made in the movie and other movies. Yeah, that was 2008. Ed had joined the, uh, in 2004, he had, uh, well, no, actually he joined the, uh, the CIA in 2006. But uh, by the time that came along, he believed that there would be reforms. And by 2013, when I 
when he, he broke the documents. This was a shock to many people. Although, as because of Ron's book and people like James Risen, I have to say James Risen wrote the 2005 uh, New York Times piece that was delayed for almost a year plus. That piece revealed mass eavesdropping, but without the hard evidence that Snowden presented. Interesting case because, you know, without, in other words, a lot of people like Ron knew that something was going on. We just knew it, but we didn't have that kind of shocking evidence. And it really, even to Bamford, was shocking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I just wanted, that's the preface of the Moscow story. So I went out of curiosity. Who's going to say no to a meeting like that? I found a young man you found, probably uh, very articulate, uh, very sincere, a man who was almost a Boy Scout, I'd say, a very bright Boy Scout in the sense that he really believed that his oath was to the Constitution, which it is, and not to the NSA or the CIA. But, you know, at 29 years old, to do what he had did merited my attention because I wanted to explore further. What, how do you do this? How do you become this kind of young man? And I think the movie reveals that through the course of its two hours. The uh, Ron Kovic story, Born on the Fourth of July, is sure. somewhat similar. Right. Ron being, and you a, thought about Ron when you're patriot, looking yeah. at Ed. Do you see comparisons between I, at those first, two? No, I was looking for a thread in, and we, uh, I said, let's tell it linear. Yep. Let's start with the military service because people don't know about that. Let's start with why he wanted to get into the CIA after he broke his legs and couldn't serve. Mm -hmm. All these things give us a background, a rich background. How he meets Lindsay Mills on an internet date. Mm -hmm. It's a first date. Uh, they meet through the internet. It's fascinating. It becomes a very important relationship in his life. Nine years. It ended well, surprisingly, because, you know, Mr. Snowden has said he thought he was a dead man when he left Hawaii. Uh, he didn't have an exit plan from Hong Kong. He basically wanted just to get this information out to these journalists who wanted it, and then he was clean of the affair and he'd take his chances, but he didn't want any of his colleagues to be tracked. He left his digital footprints with the NSA. They didn't pick up on it very fast, which shows you they're not that bright. Yep. It's not enemy of the state where they're on your ass in a second either. So uh, by the time I met him, I was, uh, I, I was very impressed with him. You know, uh, what can you say? I don't see that. He's not a, a guy I'd hang out with in a bar, no. Yeah, no so you all. didn't not, drink vodka so, he in spends Moscow? Most of his, no, I, I can talk to you all night, but <laughs> I can't. Uh, you know, he's a man who's serious and goes and gets behind his computer. He lives on New York Times still and uh, deals with reform issues that matter to him, as well as encryption issues, which are crucial. One of the things that's fascinating about Snowden is how successful he's been at projecting his image around the world from an apartment in Moscow. Uh, I set out to. He always said, this is about the message, not, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't involve me. And I think the message is clear, but people don't pay attention. They want a personality. That's yeah. the nature of, uh, yeah. that's why movies exist in a way. Right. You don't have a person. Right. So they, they focused on him, and he's the opposite of the uh, celebrity type, mm -hmm. attention yeah. seeker. Yeah. Not at all. He's but that's a, part of what you needed to reflect in the movie. This is not a particularly vivid character in terms of the traditional tropes of celebrity. No Will Smith. He's quiet. He's not, not he's Arnold soft Schwarzenegger. Spoken. He's got no muscles. No muscles, yeah. He was a good shot, but he never fires a gun in the movie, and there's no, well, there's, there is some exotic sex, but you know what I'm talking about if you've seen the movie. I can imagine Ed was a little uncomfortable with that scene. Uh, was there anything he expressed to you in a Skype uh, since then? No, no, he was, uh, he, he approved of it. Uh, he knew, <laughs> no, he knew what this is about. I mean, I found him to be very, actually doesn't see many movies. He had seen a piece of my untold history of the United States, but uh, he didn't know much about movies. He was basically a computer man, but he really understood the needs of drama. And that was my biggest fear, by the way. Right. How are we going to take all this information, which is technical and complex, and rendered into a movie that can be understood one of the in point, Alabama? One of uh, the points in the movie, uh, <laughs> one of the things I thought was interesting is uh, the idea that, uh, that he starts as um, a kind of conservative, patriotic fellow uh, from a conservative family, for the most part, uh, politically speaking, uh, who has certain ideals of loyalty loyalty to um, a, a standard uh, uh, patriotic vision of the right, and he changes through the course of the movie. That evolution seems to be one that actually does track with Ed's real life, 
but it's one that you've got to render there without people saying, oh, this is just what Oliver does to make a liberal. Um, that had to be handled deftly, I imagine. Yeah, and I certainly have firsthand experience having myself grown up as a conservative. My father uh, was a Republican all his life, an Eisenhower supporter, yeah. uh, and believed very much in, and was that the Russians were coming all the way through my youth up and through the 1950s. So I've been there, and I went to Vietnam on that basis. And when I, it took me a long, much longer than Ed to learn how to, my here's, way. Here's a question. What would you say is the nature of that sort of movement uh, from right to left, uh, your family, Ed's family? Uh, what's the quality, what's the essence of what creates that motion in that direction, in terms of principle, in terms of ideas? Well, for me, I can... I or can't. revelation. Consciousness. Consciousness. You learn as you... <laughs> You learn as you go. You have to learn from experience because if you have an ideological idea in your head, as I did, uh, the world challenges that. Do you consider yourself non-ideological now? I try to be, yes. I try to consider myself a man who lives off the experiences I've had. In other words, I'm a realist and pragmatic, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand certain uh, need for security and I need for some of the things that they're doing, absolutely understand why Ed still, f I think Ed should be the head of the NSA if you really want to know the truth, because well, he's, he is very... Well, we flair now, NSA chief, Ed Snowden, what would he well, be like? He would, he, would turn, he would be like one of those Reagan appointees that closed the agency down after their appointment. Yeah. It's sometimes those people like Reagan who end up actually say, hey, why do we need nuclear weapons for, you know? He almost got there, except for people uh, okay. like Wolfowitz who were around and told him not to. But uh, we came very close. Sometimes it's uh, Nixon hated uh, Russia, hated the, red, the communist menace, and he ended up making a deal with China and Russia. We, we learned that a lot of the right-wing people end up moving to the other side. Well, we, well sometimes On the other they hand, say well, they, that goes both directions. That's called Nixon to China in terms of the political trope. Russia, too. He made the ABM Treaty that was rescinded by Mr. Bush. Well, Don't it's forget. moving against Skype. Uh, and by yes. virtue of that, you've got your flank covered. Yeah. Um, but Mr. Bush never moved against uh, type. He, that was what's interesting about my movie about him, because yeah. he was a man who never had that capability of consciousness, he seems. Uh, it was a two-dimensional character, yeah. unlike Richard Nixon, who I tried to show as a three-dimensional character. Yeah. I'm fascinated by the psychology of that. And I know people like you do, probably, who were uh, left-wingers in their youth mm -hmm. who became extremely conservative. Many of the folks around George W. Bush started on the left and moved right. Any less legitimate? That, and as much. You don't understand that part. They have a bad experience with communism or this or that. Or well, let me ask you about this. Is the, um, the thing that I find fascinating about the Snowden journey and your journey with him is, um, is these definitions of reality. Uh, people see Laura's movie, which is an extraordinary movie. They read books. Uh, now they watch a movie. Uh, you've got to do certain things in a movie. Uh, by uh, virtue of embracing dramatic license, the things you need to do as a filmmaker. But this movie will go probably far beyond the documentary film or many of the books to be uh, embraced as reality or a reality that people find accessible and relatable. Uh, do you feel that that is an inaccuracy, an inaccurate version of what's true or the way we process reality often through movies, which has been much of your life's work. Tough question, don't you think? <laughs> uh, you had a great quote. You gave it to me in the back room. Can you repeat it? Which one? Uh, Documentary versus drama. Uh, which one? Documentary and drama. You yeah, said. well, you know, um, <laughs> I, I think that, uh, that what we find, if we live long enough, is something that folks on the far coast say. Uh, culture eats everything for breakfast. Um, some people might disagree with that, but these movies, for better or for worse, shape people's notions of reality. Uh, and I say this humbly as an author, someone who's made documentary films, uh, when a movie hits theaters, it hits so many more people than even the most successful books in most cases. And you end up dealing with that notion of what is real as the one that is prevailing. And that's the responsibility, I think, of every filmmaker to recognize that because that's the way we shape the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are as a people. 
it's largely through entertainment. No, I agree with, I, I think the documentary is a fine film and I agree with her conclusions and I, I love what she shows. Uh, it's, but it deals with real time in a, a week in his life in Hong Kong. Um, this tells you the whole picture and what he's trying to convey. He's dealing with surveillance, mass surveillance, he's dealing with uh, drone warfare and he's dealing, worst of all, with cyber warfare. It's all in there and you understand what he's scared of, what the stakes are for the world. Uh, so, you know, Milk was a great documentary and it was also was a great feature. I don't yeah. find it to be contradictory, I find it to be complementary. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Boy, Boys Don't Cry was a documentary first. Uh, there's been many versions, as you know, of Lincoln's life. I mean, I don't, I don't see any uh, contradiction between Raymond Massey and Daniel Day-Lewis, to be honest. It's, it's all a continuation of, a, of an exploration. Yeah. A story can be told many ways. Yeah. And, and that's part of what we're here to talk about is story. And you actually do some strong uh, rendering of reality, including a clip we're about to see. Uh, which really sums up, I thought rather brilliantly, uh, a world that I reported several books on, as did Jim Risen and others, uh, in a way that's vivid in terms of the way we are living uh, very, very much in a surveillance state. Um, why don't we play that clip? And it's, um, that's so interesting. And you know, here you've got a guy like Snowden saying, I want to be a patriotic uh, contributor to public service. Um, and a dilemma arises soon enough that others have felt, many whistleblowers that I've dealt with and other reporters, where they say, what do you do when you find your government has done something illegal? And you're witness to that. Are we a nation ruled by laws or men? And what is exactly my oath of loyalty? Uh, here you hear his loyalty oath, and then you see it challenged as the movie unfolds. That's correct. Loyalty, define. Follow orders, you're not in charge. The head of the NSA, the head of the CIA is in charge. If everybody is doing their own thing, there is nothing that's accomplished. I've heard that many times. And what happens if everybody says, fine, I'm aggrieved, this is illegal, I'm gonna be an Ed Snowden. Is Snowden creating with this celebrity that you're a part of? Mm -hmm a generation of Snowdens, and is that good for the exercise of power, which a nation with this power must, and for our democracy? A generation of them. Listen, Would it be better off with a whole room of Snowdens? This is a very important point throughout history and comes up again and again. I was, for example, on, an, on a smaller scale, I was in Vietnam. I took a loyalty oath uh, to serve and I was in an army in Vietnam. And I'll tell you, things started to go haywire. This is 1967-8, uh, uh, as early as that. And we, when you see things in villages and you see civilians being rousted and killed, abused, property stolen, et cetera, and raped, people raped, it's just, where do you set the line? I am a soldier. I don't believe in this. This is a form of behavior that's been sanctioned. Yes, not by the officers, but the officers are not there. So what do you do in every individual case? When you study the My Lai massacre, which is crucial to understand what each soldier did, and, and you study that day, most of them turned into beasts. Several percent, I'd say 20% watched. And probably 5% actually tried to do something. Uh, it's a sad, sad indictment of general population the mentality. And at the NSA, we had years and years of, was it 30,000 people working there off and on, roughly? We've had years and years. They do not, they, they, they sympathize with Snowden, some of them, they did. Uh, but they would not cross that line. It was their own incomes, their families, their self-interest. That is a hard, hard case and it goes on. There's good Germans everywhere. We, we don't admit it, but it, it's true. And uh, Snowden was one of those people. And I hope to God there are more whistleblowers. In fact, we have reasons to believe there are. We can discuss that in another question. But I hope to God we have decent whistleblowers who continue and continue. And we need them desperately in our society. You know, um, in some ways, this movie is an ode to a whistleblower um, and uh, someone who embraces truth 
at that level of personal risk um, has a place in any democracy. I don't think anyone doubts that. Uh, one of the things that's happened in the ensuing years is that folks at the highest levels of enforcing the law, uh, the president, certainly Eric Holder, former attorney general, uh, says, look, maybe Snowden will be a special case. Uh, what he does created a conversation that changed law. Uh, some would say some of the changes that were created are the most important since the Church Commission of the 70s. Um, and he should be treated with an understanding of that. Uh, the president himself said the debate Snowden created was of value, yeah. uh, though he must be prosecuted as any person who violates law is prosecuted. And I'll tell you from intelligence sources in Washington, there is an understanding that there are two conversations happening at once. The public conversation, which the president must, uh, uh, I think, uh, be guided by, um, and a private conversation of some sympathy for Snowden that cannot be expressed publicly because of the fear of precedent. If Snowden comes back and does not face prosecution, the fear is just what Oliver mentioned, a room full of Snowdens and the consequences of that. So with that, why don't we open up some questions? Um, folks, there are mics all throughout. Um, Hop up. Uh, I will. Uh, I will uh, offer a first question. No, someone's got to have a question for our fearless. Uh, why don't you come down to the mic so we can hear you? Uh, the rules and the questions at these forums are: uh, state your name, um, make sure it's just one question, and that it ends with a question mark. So. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Oliver. My name is Caitlin McCarthy. Big fan. Drove in from Worcester to see you. Uh, my question is this. How much veto power did Edward Snowden have over the content that was in this film? No, he turned it over to those journalists with a proviso, as in, the, uh, you haven't seen the film, but in the film no. he makes it very clear. No names. Don't hurt people. Mm -hmm. uh, use your responsibility. But it takes a lot of technical work for those newspapers to get through these files. You have to have people who know how to understand this stuff. So it, was, uh, it took a while, you know, it took a while. They're still working at it. Glenn has the whole file, Glenn Greenwald, and, uh, and he's with The Intercept, which is perhaps one of the more progressive uh, organs of criticism. Uh, I look forward to more from him. Mm -hmm. uh, the other ones have the time, the New York Times has it, but that's no uh, guarantee of, uh, of uh, revelation, actually, they have the uh, the Guardian files in New York. They're the custodians of it. The Guardian has done a lot, uh, perhaps not enough for Julian Assange, and uh, the Washington Post. Yeah. Uh, he, was that your employer at one point? Or uh, no, Wall Street oh. Journal. Yep. Oh, Wall Street Journal. Uh, Mark Elman. Mark great, Elman. Great Washington uh, Mark Post Elman reporter. had the invitation to go, uh, and he's writing a book. I'm anxious to read the book. Uh, but he's, uh, it's coming out soon, actually this month. But Bart, uh, uh, the Post or whatever happened, they didn't, they didn't go. Right. Well, thank you for making But they have the film. file. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yep. Hello, Mr. Stone. My name is Diego. We're here. Hi. Uh, first of all, happy early birthday. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> That's not yet. <laughs> I'm a big fan of your movies. Uh, Natural Born Killers and Savages are some of my favorites. Uh, my question here is regarding your movie, South of the Border. Uh, it's a movie about uh, Hugo Chavez and other leftist heads of state in Latin America. Um, let's pull this out here. So according to the Associated Press, uh, they said you said you felt no need to present the opposition's argument. Tariq Ali, the writer for the movie, said to the New York Times that the point was not to have an academic debate, but to present a sympathetic view of these people. Uh, right now in Venezuela, the GDP is expected to contract by 10%. It has the highest murder rate in the world, and uh, inflation is at about higher than 100%. So my question is, do you still now hold a sympathetic view of Chavez and the leftist heads of government in Latin America 
now that the socialist policies enacted in Venezuela have reached their logical end game? Thank you. Well, I don't think that's a fair stated question. I think that Mr. Chavez died uh, almost three years ago uh, from a very sudden cancer. Certainly a lot of people wished him dead. And uh, his, the leadership was handed over to Mr. Maduro, who is no, uh, was not as effective, not at all effective like uh, Hugo was in leading the country. And this is a sad story. There is a lot of mismanagement in Venezuela, and much of it is exaggerated by his opponents, especially the Venezuelan right. I remind you that they told us there was press censorship and that Chavez was a dictator. He was elected so many times with international monitoring bodies watching it. He's no dict he was no dictator. He was a choice of the people. And he raised the poverty level, the extreme poverty, by something like 20, 25%. Uh, they loved him, and he, he would have been re-elected if he hadn't been, let's say, suspiciously dead. Uh, so you don't have the, the true picture from the Venezuelan bourgeoisie about him. The media that I saw in Venezuela was highly negative about him because all the newspapers were owned by the oligarchy, as they are in Brazil, which also recently had a coup against a legitimate democratically elected president in Dilma. Uh, so this is a very tricky, I mean, the New York Times, Simon Romero, who was uh, the reporter there for much of this uh, new criticism, I, I think I read 99 articles out of 99 were critical, highly critical. So I would, I would really examine the motives of the critics of Venezuela. We could do a whole hour on Chavez. Thank you for your question. Um, how about you, my friend? Uh, hello, uh, my name is Frankie Hill. I'm a sophomore at the college. Uh, do you believe there is any chance that Edward Snowden will ever return to the, the United States, and will he want to? He certainly wants to, and he would, you know, he would, he would go for trial if it was a fair trial, and where he could pre pre prevent, uh, present evidence in his defense. He cannot do so under the statutes of the Espionage Act of 1917, uh, which limits the... Uh, which was the Sabotage Act, and you cannot bring into a, the national security matters into the courtroom. So everything is national security as far as it's, his opposition is concerned, everything. There's no defense. So he would uh, do it under other circumstances. He'd be glad to come back, and he misses the country. But from abroad, he remains one of its reformers. He believes in the, uh, in the defense of the country, but properly organized and controlled. And right now, we're out of control. No one's watching this secret government. One thing Ron didn't say is that, yes, Obama has given great lip service to this, great lip service, and done nothing. He appointed a commission of five experts, terror experts, to examine uh, the laws and the NSA laws. And they came up with the, in December of 2014, they condemned it wholeheartedly and made 45 suggestions for reform and said there was no evidence that mass eavesdropping has solved one single incident of terrorism. Uh, so uh, I just want to make one yeah. more point is that the president did, uh, did nothing with those reforms and continued to build the greatest, most massive surveillance system globally in the history of mankind without basically democratic consent. The president did say publicly that he thought the debate Snowden launched was one of value and did that, change yeah. legislation, though. Um, I mean, duly noted. Uh, you know, I, my question to you is, was it um, cinematic license in the movie to seem to indicate that part of what drove Snowden to his actions was being dispirited about how little Obama did because that was a suggestion in the movie? I'm not sure if Snowden has ever said that with much clarity. <laughs> he's in a position, perhaps, he hopes for a pardon. Uh, oh, gosh, you think that's really the, the, I do the cause? I don't know that he, listen, I, listen, it's his case, and I think that Ed would like to come back. And There's no doubt. I, if you take a position op overly critical of the United States uh, from abroad, it, it deepens your dilemma. Mm -hmm. It's a tough position to be in, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I do know that he has said it, uh, the reforms were drapes, 
changing of the drapes in the White House. But uh, uh, no, Obama has not been faithful to the concept of reform at all. He really hasn't. And on the contrary, he's built it up the opposite way, far more than George Bush ever dreamed. Um, why don't we go to another question here? Thank you very much. Hi. What's Hello, name? my name is Jessica Bixby, and I am a student here at the Harvard Kennedy School. To turn back towards the cinematic side, I was wondering how you chose your writer, co-writer Karen Fitzgerald, and worked with him to develop um, a narrative that both spoke to the dramatic side as well as um, tell the story of Edward Snowden. How we did it? Yeah, how you chose to work with that writer and then kind of the process of well, creating we, that we narrative. Through trial and error, it was uh, a tremendously complicated process. We went back and forth, back and forth. We wrote separately. Uh, keeping it dramatic was the hardest of all because it would get bogged down in all this data. So uh, it, we, the process of screenwriting went on for approximately the entire year, including the shooting. And then in the editing, we were still doing some rewriting. I like to do that in the editing. So it was a very uh, tortured process, I have to say. The script is available, by the way, in, in uh, its last form from uh, a New York uh, Skyhorse, Skyhorse publisher. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a four minute clip I'd like to show, and then we'll get right to your question. I guess say that scene is why we make movies. <laughs> that is incredibly compelling. You know, to, you feel that, and you feel, uh, it's hard not to feel violated when you watch that, and that is the, the truth of the case. The information they have on all of us is that detailed, that intimate. The founders thought about this. It's in the Federalist Papers, talking about a man from Hoboken should be safe in his person, should not be stopped and violated, held against his will. No different, but this is reality. How about over here? I'm sorry I ignored this mic. No, it's not. Is it working? Yeah, I think so. Um, hi, my name is uh, Noni Shongwani. I'm from South Africa, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. I have a question regarding the last comment that you made, um, that the, there's a role for, uh, for people like Snowden, especially in a participatory um, democracy. What then becomes the implications of governments to be able to manage intelligence? Um, and how then do institutions like the CIA hire people um, moving forward in a way that is representative of the interests um, of citizens? Um. Powers have always had intelligence services. You know, the Greeks and the Romans had them too. Uh, it's been part of the arsenal of what uh, countries do to exercise power, to know what they need to know. Um, I will say, though, that people who have spent a life in intelligence, and one I'll note is Daniel Patrick Moynihan. I suggest there's a terrific book called Secrecy that Moynihan wrote late in his life after spending years on the Senate Intelligence Committee. And what he says is secrecy is wildly overrated in ways that are stunning and often disastrous. What cannot endure sunlight uh, is not material to the way a democracy must conduct itself. That's what Moynihan says. And he's a hard-eyed guy. And I think one of the questions that this movie raises and others, including Assange, who has been treated much less favorably than Snowden in the public eye, uh, as well as the many whistleblowers or sources that go to Jim Risen or Dana Priest or someone like me, they almost all arrive at that place to say the enormous body of secret information uh, is not the thing that is valuable and material to the needs of a democracy. That's why they come out into the sunlight at often great risk. Um, the question of we need intelligence and how can we do it with people like Snowden? Well, look, it's not like we're gonna stop doing it, but people like Snowden do provide a check to say if you violate the duly constituted laws, which is why Snowden comes out and others come forward. The law is stated, 
cases against either the spirit or the letter of the law, those people are a check and part of the self-correcting checks that are mentioned in that scene as what makes America and other democracies work, which are the self-corrections. I suppose that would be my answer. How about you up here? I'm sorry I left you waiting, and I'll come back yeah, to no you worries. too because you've been waiting a long time. Hi, uh, my name is Will. I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, and actually that clip is an awesome introduction to my question because um, there was a pretty clear bias in the way that it was um, produced. And so um, I also noticed on the trailer that uh, when kind of nouns were flashing describing Edward Snowden, um, the word traitor was followed by the word hero. And I know that there's a lot of people who feel very strongly about using one or the other adjective to describe him. And so um, given that this is a very current and controversial issue, um, I'm wondering if kind of when making this movie you try to restrict your own bias or if you just kind of like let it have free reign or if you deliberately try to portray the issue um, one way or the other, depending on like how you personally thought. I have a little problem with the mic. So what was the last part of that question? He's please? asking if you are a biased filmmaker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Very concise, thank yeah. you. If you're just carrying forward some liberal agenda stone, <laughs> <laughs> or if you tamp that down, rein it in, uh, to try to appeal well, you, you to have a to be the judge larger of that. purpose. You know, I think you have to be the judge of that. I, you could say uh, this is also is a libertarian film too, and you can, you know, mm. in other words, uh, part of me is that too. <clears throat> um, and uh, you know, the conservative side, they, many of them were libertarians and defended Snowden, Ron Paul. Several people, actually, you know, 50 Republicans voted for the Freedom Act. Uh, so you have to think about some of what you're saying. Don't, don't go in along those old-fashioned lines. Uh, I can. Let me ask you. You're yeah. asking a very pertinent question. Journalists often find this, if whatever they are politically, you know, left or right, sure. they have to be aware of that and try to rein that in in their reporting. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a common dilemma. And I guess he's asking if you recognize your political beliefs as such, and you are mindful to rein them in. I mean, what do you say to that? Well, I mean, I did as much research uh, with my co-writer as we possibly could, I think. Uh, we saw the statements that Hayden made and Alexander. We saw the debates with Glenn Greenwald and, uh, and uh, Hayden. Uh, we read the journalists that were critical of him. I, I don't know how much further you can go than I made nine visits to Moscow to try to get his side of the story. There's only so far you can go before you gotta say enough. I gotta get, there's a drama here, there's a story. And when we told that, when we stripped the, uh, the, uh, all the research out, you, you gotta make a movie that works because people wanna see what happens next. I would never consciously distort the truth for that goal, mm -hmm. never. never. I never felt that I have. I felt like I've abided by the spirit of the truth. Mr. Mr. Snowden agrees, but that's, of course, his version of the story. But that's not what we told. We told it the way it makes sense to us as dramatists. That's, what I, that's the line I follow. Remember, I did a movie about Richard Nixon that so many people criticized for being too friendly. I did a movie about George Bush. People were angry with me from the left because it wasn't critical enough. But that was the role of a dramatist. The dramatist walks in the shoes of the person He's portrayed from his point of view. And that's what I call empathy, not sympathy, empathy. That's what I tried to do in this case. Thank you. Much. How about over here, one more. Uh, my name is Thomas, over here, Mr. Stone. Um, I'm, I'm Thomas, I'm a sophomore at the college, and I know that the material in this film is very sensitive. It's, it covers a lot of uh, uh, very controversial topics. And I imagine that making the film was not an easy task. But that being said, for you and, or your writer, what was the easiest part of this film for you to make? The easiest? The easiest part. The easiest part. I don't know that there was one. Uh, <laughs> How about the hardest part? It was just a physical challenge to build all these sets with some degree of accuracy described to us by uh, Ed Snowden. Uh, to keep within a budget that was so tight because we didn't have major studio support. It was done by independents. Uh, if we had fallen a day behind, it would have been in, we would have been in trouble. So those are tense, there was a tension to this whole thing. Uh, the, uh, 
making it the editing process, trying to do it in two hours, two hours and 10 minutes, six minutes actually, how do you tell that story uh, without violating it, without stripping it of its essentials? One thing we did find that's true about drama is that actually we caught something that very few journalists caught. They made, they treated Lindsay Mills very lightly. When you see the movie, I think you'll understand that part of this is the relationship between him and her that's the steadiest thing in his life, that keeps him, let's say, human, keeps him considerate, that she has an opposite point of view, and then as the story blends, they become, he comes closer to her point of view, and we reveal, the, I think we reveal the, what it means to him when he loses her in the film. So without that story, I don't think you really understand that Ed Snowden is a human being. He's, he would be a drone, he'd be another NSA drone, essentially. It's very important. That's what drama can do that sometimes journalism cannot do. And as to journalism, you know, I have to say Bart Gelman is one of the toughest journalists in the world. He knows his stuff. He told, he told me after he saw the movie, point blank, he said, there are things in this movie that no one knows. Uh, he's referencing certain programs that are mentioned that have not been in the news. So we did both sides. I mean, we did a lot of research, but at the same time, we tried to keep it human. We talked to Lindsay. We realized the degree, the depth of that relationship. Isn't that a fantasy of yours, to make a movie that makes news? And did you do that here? There are things in the movie that haven't even been discussed, discovered yet. So I'm going to hold off on that until it comes out, because I think some interesting things will come out. I think some NSA people may not immediately speak, but there might be something later. I know I have a feeling, and I, I'm not alone in this, Jim Bamford uh, very strongly believes that this uh, DNC hack, so to speak, easily blamed on the Russians, is actually an inside job, and he thinks there is a second leaker, which would be great news for most of us. Uh, it'd be nice to know there's someone on the inside who still cares. There's going to be stuff like this. There's information about programs in this movie that has not been revealed yet. We just have another minute or two. Let me ask you a question. Do you think, Oliver, your movie will encourage other leakers? Ah. <laughs> Is that what you're hoping? Well, that wasn't the reason. I made it to make a good movie, to, make a, to, make, uh, to tell this story as accurately as we can. Uh, side effects uh, are out of my control. Mm. Right. <laughs> Uh, you know, this is one of the reasons that we love to sit with Oliver Stone, because he is every bit as interesting, and I dare say more interesting, than many of the subjects in his movies. So without further ado, we're going to go to the Harvard uh, Film Archive is going to show the film now, and we are going to give it up for Oliver Stone. Thank you.